My name is Emma Mags and this is Wild Femmes. Before we kick off, I would like to let you know that this episode touches on areas of gender-based violence and relationship abuse and I really want you to be emotionally prepared. Today's guest is exceptionally inspiring and is the definition of someone who is creating real impact. Thanks to the universe, I met her with her gorgeous dog, Chloe, at our local cafe on the beautiful Coal Coast. So we're starting today a little different. She pioneered a digital crowd mapping tool that we'll go into more soon. She's on the Victorian honor roll of women. She's named one of the 100 most influential, creative and provocative people in Melbourne by the age. One of the Women's Weekly Women of the Future for Innovation and Technology in 2019. Her company was listed on the Smart Company Smart 30 list for 2018 and 19. She's been the winner of multiple pitch competitions, including the City of Melbourne Knowledge Week International Prize. She is a She Starts alumni. She was sponsored by Google for startups to travel to San Fran to participate in the Black Box Accelerator program. She is the young social pioneer with the Foundation for Young Australians, finalist for the Victorian Young Achiever Awards in 2020, and she founded She's a Crowd, which is the national winner for the Telstra Best of Business Awards in 2022. And I could go on, but I am so excited to dive in. Zoe, thank you so much for joining Wild Femmes. And thank you so much for the beautiful intro, by the way. Um, It's always interesting listening to that back because it does sound really, (laughs) it does sound like a lot. I mean, it's hard to get out. Like, there were so many (laughs) wonderful things on that list. I just, yeah. No, it's almost like a trip down memory lane doing all those amazing programs and just all the the support that I've had has been so incredible. Now, that is a seriously impressive and inspiring list of awards and achievements. So I'm going to dive right in and ask, do you view yourself as successful? Oh, I think that that's an interesting question. Um, I only very recently accepted that the business that I run is is now successful and I don't think that it was any award um, or any type of accolade that um, that did that because I think that those things are so important and so great for recognition and they're such a nice moment but they do seem so surreal when they happen as well and you still feel that sense of like imposter syndrome a lot of the time. I recently got to a point where I realized that I had enough knowledge to help other people do similar things and, and with it, with their initiatives. And I think that I realized, you know, I've actually learned so much and achieved so many of my goals with She's a Crowd and beyond that, that I'm now at a point where I can actually give, give back in a lot of ways. Um, Yeah. And that to me feels like something I'm really proud of yeah and I think success is a funny one because I mean it's personal but it's also a real it's it's something that I was reflecting on it a a bit recently because I think that when you're um really at the start you do have to hustle and you're constantly trying to find the right people to support you trying to put your ideas out there which makes you feel very vulnerable with the hope that it will, you know, succeed, but the knowledge that if it doesn't, everyone will see because you put it out there and you're always just trying to like, you know, push, push, push. Then there's this kind of tipping point that happens where you've achieved a level of success and then people stop seeing it as that you're just kind of pushing and hustling and you need favours, but then they start seeing, they start perceiving you as success. But the moment in time when other people start seeing you as successful and when you start seeing yourself as successful, I find it often different moments. So often other people start seeing you successful Mm -hmm. before you do. At least that's how I feel. And I, I think a lot of like female founders in particular probably feel that way. And so then that's a really tricky moment because other people might see you as really successful and you still think you're hustling. And that's when I feel like, you know, you can end up working with the wrong people or having difficult experiences with people who might be actually trying to use you or exploit you in some way because you don't understand your own success properly yet. So I actually think it's really important to reflect on and understand your own success and view yourself as successful and view yourself as valuable because you need to start valuing, you know, your time at a certain point. You need to start valuing, you know, what you bring. Otherwise you can be quite open to that kind of 
mm, expo exploitation maybe is a strong word, but you know, yeah. So I was reflecting on that. You actually touched on a lot of things that I would love to delve into. It's actually really rare that you get to take a beat to actually look back at all your accolades. The first time I really did it is actually just recently when I went on mat leave. I've never actually stopped and gone through my whole folio and been like, oh, oh yeah, I actually like, I have done some cool things. But as you said, you're always in the hustle and you're always like, what's next? What's next? What's next? So you touched on something else there as well that I thought was really interesting is imposter syndrome. And I believe that everyone probably suffers from this at some point in their lives. I was just wondering when imposter syndrome creeps up on you, it's often, I find it's often before like a big meeting or a presentation or something of those lines. How do you move through it? No, that's a good question. I read a really interesting article about imposter syndrome. It was actually about how imposter syndrome is you know, a term we've all heard, I'm sure, but it really frames the problem as a internal, like individual problem. Like even the word syndrome it's speaks like us. to There's kind of, wrong with us. it's something wrong with you inside you that you need to overcome. And then this article was really talking about how actually, and I just love this so much. And this just aligns with, you know, my philosophies and everything about, you know, what I do with She's a Crowd and my research as well is actually imposter syndrome needs a bit of a reframe because it's not so much an individual problem or obstacle that you need to overcome, but it's actually something that's put on you by society and by the, depending on the workplace or context that you're experiencing it in, I guess. But I feel like because imposter syndrome is experienced more by minority groups or like women, people of colour. It's kind of one of those things that everyone thinks that they are experiencing alone and that no one else around them feels like that. But once people start sharing their stories and talking about their experiences, they realise that they're actually not alone at all and everyone else is feeling exactly that same way. And that's when you start realising this is actually a systemic issue that I've been made to feel like I don't belong here this isn't for me or I haven't had role models who look like me in this space or um, there are ways of communicating that are masculinist or patriarchal that don't suit me and don't quite feel right something doesn't quite feel right I don't feel accepted and, that, and there's so many different ways that that can come out whether it's a gendered thing or something to do with mm people's neurodivergence or whatever it is there are so many ways that that can be expressed and so I think with imposter syndrome one thing that I've always 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 told myself is like if I feel like this then there are other people who feel like this and everyone gets up every day and goes to work and you wouldn't necessarily see see that because people are really good at just getting on with it just realizing that like you know, I'm not the only one who feels like this. Everyone's feeling like this. That that really helps. And I think that that's a really similar thing that we see with, you know, themes of gender-based violence and sexual assault where people will keep it in and think that, you know, they're the only ones experiencing this in this particular way or this abusive yeah. relationship. And then once they start talking, they realise that it's systemic they're and not alone. they can see common threads and themes with other people's stories and they realise they're not alone. And I think, yeah, it's actually on the systems that we have to exist within because we don't exist within a vacuum. So you can't overcome imposter syndrome alone. I think you need to talk about it and have a community around you in order to kind of, to, to really overcome it. And that's certainly been something that I've always kind of told myself. I really like that approach of a reframe. It's almost like trying to break a bad habit. Mm. Now you mentioned Zoe at the beginning of She's a Crowd is dramatically different to Zoe now in relation to how you own your power. What are the differences now? If, if you're committed to growing and you're committed to learning and throughout your life, this is going to happen where you go from being a big fish in a small pond to mm. a small fish in a big pond. I used to work in international development and I felt like I'd gotten, I, I was pretty confident in my job and my abilities and my trajectory. And then I quit my job and started She's a Crowd and it was really stressful. I mean, the first six months, it was like, you know, I didn't have an income. So there's that pressure. And I ended up living in my van to save money on rent. Yeah, there was that kind of like, 
just that living situation being difficult and you know like just not knowing where you're next i'm feeling stretched if shower was coming from <laughs> or your let alone paycheck yeah and then all of that stuff and then you're kind of going to meetings and i didn't even know what a startup was when i started she's a crowd and so now you have an award-winning one <laughs> yeah as it turns out so it was like a very steep learning curve and I think my approach was like I'm just gonna be really open to learning (laughs) and I'm and I'm gonna take on all the feedback and I'm going to just have an open mind and listen to every what everyone's telling me and because I don't know anything and looking back I think I didn't give myself enough credit and that's the advice that I give as well to founders starting up because I think it is so important to take on feedback and other people's views and people sometimes don't do that enough and it is so important to learn but I think you also need to trust yourself and trust your intuition and your you're there you're doing it for a reason and so there was knowledge that I did have that I probably didn't give myself enough credit for that I now totally do and I think that's one of the, the biggest probably changes yeah That's super interesting. So like, what are the negatives of not owning your power then? Because like, when you get to your level of a startup, I'm sure that if you don't have the competence or the ownership in what you're achieving, that can start to have a negative impact on the work. The negatives of not owning your power. I mean, it's it's a bit cheesy, but you really do have to, at a certain point, believe in your own point of view and your own lived experience and your own perspective and your own approach. Because what happens is everyone has an opinion and everyone has advice and you can't take every single person's advice because it's going to be conflicting sometimes or just bad advice sometimes and there are going to be people who like completely underestimate you if you really just took all of that on I don't know I personally would probably not have achieved you know what I have today so I think that really standing on your power means understanding when to take on other people's perspectives and when to go, actually, I want to do it this way. And that's that's the way you're doing it. (laughs) Yep. Clear decisions. Like I actually like my approach here and I think that this is going to work and I actually would like to role model something different. And I think in order to be able to create a better world, we have to be able to imagine one. And if you only take on people's advice that who are older and more experienced than yourself or, you know, men, (laughs) basically, you know, we're just going to end up with another. Yeah, it's just going to be the same as how they did it. So there has to be, yeah, a bit of, you know, owning your own approach and um, and figuring. And someone told me something really interesting, which I never forgot when I first started She's a Card, which was like, treat advice like data points. Once you hear the same thing enough times, you know, it's more valuable. So wait until you've heard, you know, and and who is, who is giving you this advice, kind of really treat advice like data and look at the quality of it, who it's it's coming from. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, how many times you're getting the same advice and then start paying attention to it once, once it's come up (laughs) multiple times. This is a brilliant segue because I think it would be remiss of me not to get you to fully explain to us what She's a Crowd is yeah. because it is the biggest yeah. geospatial data set of sexual assault and gender-based violence in the world and you've collected like over 100,000 reports of survivors. Yeah. So can you please share with us what it is and what's your mission? So She's a Crowd is a feminist tech startup and we use crowdsource data to make cities and spaces safer for women and gender diverse people and close the gender data gap. So around 90% of sexual assault is never reported to authorities. And so this is where we start talking about the gender data gap where, you know, we know that these incidents are unfortunately really common. Gender-based violence, sexual assault is pretty ubiquitous across the world. And yet we see severe underreporting in every country. And that means that decision makers don't have the data that they need to understand and address the problem. And we believe that if you can't understand a problem, you can't fix it. And a lot of the time, we really need to take the time to understand exactly what's happening and on what scale, the depth and breadth of the issue before we can really address it in any meaningful way. And so I wanted to create 
a data set that allowed decision makers to understand the problem and zoom in and out of it. So you could look at a particular neighborhood or a particular demographic, or you could look at a really high level across a country or across the world. I really wanted the data to be geospatial because mapping is a fascinating way to visualize data and understand it. And I didn't think it had been really done. I noticed that people don't really believe women and really don't believe survivors in general. But when you put our stories on a map, all of a sudden people take it a little more seriously. Why is that? Why do people not believe women when they come forward with their stories? God, how long have you got? (laughs) People don't believe survivors. People especially don't believe women gender diverse um, people because it's pretty ingrained in a patriarchal society to really underestimate a problem that you don't experience. So like, it's also a very inconvenient problem for men. And I think sexual assaults, rapes and domestic violence, it's very recent, very, very recent that we've had mechanisms to understand the harm it causes. Like trauma was only really understood Mm -hmm. as a medical issue in the 90s. And so if you think about sexual trauma, we now understand how traumatic those events can be, even if they're not physically scarring. But we didn't understand that until very, very recently. Similarly, domestic violence was seen as a domestic issue and something to be resolved within a family rather than as a public facing issue and something that needs to be resolved by the state or the criminal justice system. So these things have all happened actually very, very recently. And I think there's still a lot of catching up to do in terms of the criminal justice system and the medical system and the way that we understand these issues to actually have harm. And we can see that the criminal justice system doesn't actually work for survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence at all. That's because these archaic ways of understanding the issue are still very much at play. And then I think what happens is like women will share these stories anecdotally among ourselves and we have been doing so for like millennia. It won't be read as a real problem by men or by society at large because seen as kind of anecdotal or it was just you know that oh that yeah like that's that sucks that that happened to you but I'm sure like not all men are like that or whatever and I think that to actually understand the problem men need to take accountability for the way that they benefit from that because even if they're not directly perpetrators they benefit from the systems that protect perpetrators and protect men and so yeah when you're trying to report or you're trying to be believed or you're trying to tell men it actually takes quite an evolved man to be able to not take that on defensively because it's asking men for a certain amount of accountability even if they're not perpetrators and a lot of men they aren't capable emotionally of taking that on without being defensive yeah so how do organisations and uh, cities and states I guess how do they work with She's a Crowd to close that data gap around gender-based violence? Yeah, so we'll, we work with yeah, governments or like transport companies, like road share companies and NGOs, and they access our data. We have a insights dashboard and they can log on and see the data. So they can see across their state or mm. across the country And then they can filter and access different insights and graphs and things like that from there and download reports. We also do custom reports for them if there's a particular project. And then they use that. We've had them use that in policy, for example, personal safety policies around transport and then in advocacy as well. So a lot of the time what we find is like they know that there's a problem. They don't have the data to actually either get the right funding toward the problem or to advocate internally within their department for the problem or to put it in policy because they don't have the data that reflects the problem. So we assist with that. So you're helping to quantify the issue? Yeah, we quantify it, but then we can also create insights like, you know, in this particular area, you're going to need more lighting, you're going to need, or like we're doing a lot of rideshare work right now and advocating for making sure that rideshare takes into account gendered safety We've just finished a short film and we're going to be releasing a report on 
on the ride chain industry soon and that's more of an advocacy piece to go look at this because we've got so much data on and around ride share of the way that automated transport futures mm. can actually increase risk for marginalized groups just things like that that might not have been considered with a gendered lens or with the lens of yeah sexual assault and, and harassment that's incredible what has been some of the positive response or feedback or moments since you started She's a Crowd? I mean, I think it's been overwhelmingly positive. The thing that really keeps me going is the survivor stories. I've had survivors say, after sharing my story with She's a Crowd, my recurring nightmares that I'd experienced for years after my sexual assault stopped because I was finally able to feel heard. And we always wanted to create, so I've talked a lot about the data today, but I we've very, very, very central, very, very importantly, and probably what we've spent most of the last four years doing is making sure that we design the platform where people share their stories in a way that's survivor-centric and that really honours their story first and foremost. And creates a safe environment as well. Yeah. So for so many people, like, they've never had that experience. They've never had that experience of being like, this is valid, um, and and we will actually say throughout that process, like, we believe you, thank you for sharing, you know, all of that stuff. And so mm-hmm. I just hear all the time every day, I get messages saying, thank you so much, I feel this weight lifted off my chest or I finally was able to share my story for the first time or sharing my story and she's a crowd gave me the confidence to then go and report it to the police or something like that. So it's a really important cathartic process for survivors and that, that's everything I could ever ask for like if it was that alone you know I'd be happy that's amazing you mentioned that like obviously a lot of people share their stories and they feel better and that you help them through that process if you have a friend or family member that comes to you wanting to share something like this I'm just wondering what is like what are some of tips you can give us that can like help us help them through that moment like what is kind of the language just trying to help them through it so you listen and then you say, <laughs> I don't want to be too prescriptive, but honestly, you say, thank you for sharing that with me. I'm sorry that that happened to you. You didn't deserve it. And I believe you. What would you like from me now? Yes. Yeah, so important too, that we know how to help in those situations. Cause I think sometimes people can get lost yeah. and not sure or not say the right thing. So I guess, yeah, like what you said about listening is super crucial. I have to ask, like, what inspired you to start She's a Crowd? Because it's obviously a very specific area that you've based yourself in. I was already working in gender advocacy and policy when I started She's a Crowd. And I was working in that space because I had experienced an abusive relationship. So I had started sharing my story and I noticed when when I started sharing my story... I noticed the effect that it had on myself and the shame that I felt kind of dissolving away. And I noticed that you become a magnet for other people's stories. I think Sarah Ahmed said something about when you put it out there that you're listening, people will come to you to be heard. And I think that I experienced that and I saw that. And then I started Australia's first ever crowd mapping platform for street harassment, which was called Free to Be in 2016 and that was really amazing and successful within the organization i was in but then because it was within a kind of ngo model i didn't see that it had a sustainable business model behind it or a way to continue and i really wanted it to be Mm. something that was always available for survivors and then the me too movement happened and i was like this is my moment like this is a kind of convergence of my personal story professional kind of experience that i was at And then, you know, societal kind of moment where it was the the issue was at the forefront of public consciousness. And I was like, I kind of have to do it now. And then, yeah. You just seized the day. Made that leap and, yeah. And how lucky we are that you did that. So it it is true that sometimes like our big life moments are culminating into these and pointing us in these directions. What are some of the long-term impacts that you personally might have experienced from having an abusive relationship? I mean, I think that most of the time it's that I was able to work in this field and start this (laughs) because it's a, you know, I love turning negative things into positive things. So I 
feel so lucky that I've been able to do that. And I think having that really intimate knowledge of what it's like to be in an abusive relationship, I think is so important to the work that I do. I think that it's really still quite misunderstood. It's better um, than it was when I was in that situation. What emotionally abusive relationships look like and what coercive control looks like. We didn't even have that term that I know of, like coercive control and the way that, you know, emotionally abusive relationships lead to physically, sexually abusive, and it all usually happens all at once and together and overlapping and all mm. those things. I'll still have those kind of that voice in my head from that relationship telling me not to believe myself or not to believe my own perceptions because gaslighting is where, you know, someone's tried to basically make you feel like you're crazy and that your perceptions of things manipulating you yeah your perception of what's going on is incorrect and skewed and you don't no longer trust yourself you no longer trust the way that you see the world that's basically what happens when you are properly gaslit i think it's such an overused term now but i would prefer that it's overused than underused which is was underused when i experienced it that still sometimes comes into my my mind for sure when you're emotionally triggered and you have that gaslighting voice in your head Mm. what is the coping mechanism that you use to get through it because that must really bring you Mm. back I think that's it's a tricky one but I think that it just takes so much Mm. time surrounding yourself with people who are never who who aren't going to do that and who you can talk to about this stuff is really really important And I think I've just done a lot of work to like learn to trust myself again and to quiet, to quieten that voice. And I think once again, like hearing other people's stories and similar experiences and being able to share my own around this really helps as well. Because you have a framework for understanding that this is actually just, it's just a voice that's, it's just like, you know, and it's always going to be a part of you, but it doesn't have to be like the biggest part. Yeah, it's not something that has to kind of, overwhelm your experience anymore I think like even just simple stuff like having the language to describe it like what what it is is so important and that's something that has really helped because like when I was experiencing it I'd never heard the term gaslighting or the language that we use now to understand this and I think that's so important I feel like gaslighting as a term only really became apparent to me in the last like yeah five years or so like I feel like we hadn't really heard it before and now it's becoming quite a term that's Mm -hmm. used in the workplace in all different types of situations you obviously experienced a lot of trauma from that relationship what are some of the steps you took to heal from that because when I first met you and like even today talking to you you are a very confident successful person you've obviously done a great deal of work personally and professionally into your own development so what are some of the steps you've taken over the years to repair that trauma therapy (laughs) and therapy really like um and the people that I have around me and my friends is really yeah yeah and I guess like we should be really grateful too that the stigma around getting therapy is starting to break down as well way Mm -hmm. more like almost it's got to be the right therapy because like so many therapists are not attuned to abusive relationships they're only attuned to fixing relationships Mm, yeah that's interesting part of your healing was actually like one of the first steps was hearing other people's stories so you've almost created like circular healing for yourself and the other people within your platform which I think is so beautiful and I'm hoping a lot of other people feel the same way as you so you've obviously achieved a great deal with she's a crowd like what is your blue sky scenario what do you hope to do if budget wasn't an issue with she's a crowd um yeah, well, I used to say we wanted to be the biggest geospatial database, which we now are. So I better come up with a new goal. Congratulations. So the last four years we've really been trying to focus on the platform for survivors. And I think the next four years is going to be really focusing on the way that we deliver data. So really becoming a really solid source of knowledge for decision making. I would like to see gender mainstreamed across decision making and I'd like to be a part of that and help support decision makers to do that and so we're really trying to focus in on delivering really valuable insights and what we do with the data that we now have. We're just about to wrap up and I just have a couple of super quick questions that can literally be one word or 
a cup like yeah. a really quick sentence. So, what book would you recommend every woman should read? Sarah Ahmed, Living a Feminist Life, and Data Feminism. Do you believe in intuitive business? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and feminist leadership. If you can summarize for me the most important question of the day, well, maybe not the most important, but how do you stay wild in life, love, and career? I think um, I'm always trying to be grounded and be in nature and just connect with people and get in touch with that wild woman. I think that it makes you feel really bold, makes you feel like you have a way of understanding the world and a way of knowing things that is not necessarily tangible and can't be read out <laughs> at the beginning of a of you know a podcast or can't be put on a piece of paper and I'm always just trying to tap into um my my intuition with decision making so I think that learning to listen and learning to base a lot of decisions on your intuition is really 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 important and a lot of the time people want explanations for why you've done something or how you've done something but I'm always trying to really like listen to that and tap into that because intuition is just like your experience speaking and kind of an inner knowledge and neurons firing from your yeah yeah so I, I think that it's really really important to listen to amazing that is such a beautiful answer thank you so much and thank you for taking the time for joining us today i know that you are crazy busy so i really appreciate it thank you so much emma thanks for joining us on our mission to explore how women stay wild all over the world we hope that you continue to tune in everywhere you love to listen on youtube spotify iHeartRadio, apple podcasts and audible Stay wild.